Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and we are going to continue our study of embedded systems design by looking at computer software. So up until this point, we've kind of looked at computer hardware, and we talked about kind of the terminology that we use, and we described kind of a generic block diagram of, of a computer of consisting of a central processing unit that has three subsystems in it. One is the control unit, which is the large state machine that performs the fetch, decode, and execute uh, cycle for every instruction that is currently that is being executed. Uh, we talked about registers that are fast storage devices within the CPU that hold information, some of it dedicated, such as addresses associated with the fetch, uh, the fetch operations, some dedicated to hold maybe the opcodes coming in from, from program memory, uh, status registers, et cetera, other registers of general purpose that we get to just use as, you know, use as <clears throat> part of our program. And then we have the ALU, uh, which is the arithmetic logical unit. And this is the big combinational logic circuitry that performs any operations that an instruction might be designed to, to do, such as adds or subtracts. And then we have this memory mapped uh, system over here that consists of program memory, data memory, and ports. And I say memory mapped uh, because everything over here has a unique address associated with it. And now we are looking at software. <clears throat> now, software is, just remember that program memory is gonna hold the codes, the operation codes for every instruction that we insert into program memory. And the, the order that you put these instructions into memory and which instructions you put into memory is going to basically create some sort of algorithm that will accomplish a task. And the software developer is the person that actually chooses which instructions to use, uh, whether they're gonna repeat, whether they're jumped over, whether they are uh, executed more than once. And so that holds development of how you insert the opcodes for each instruction that you wanna use in your program sits into program memory. So when you talk about software design, you are talking about putting these opcodes, these binaries into program memory in order to accomplish a task. So that's what we're gonna go through right now. And a lot of this is terminology to kind of just stay consistent with the way we're gonna describe these systems. Okay, remember, you have a CPU that has a set of instructions that it knows how to execute. The set of instructions that that particular hardware can execute is called its instruction set. And the hardware is designed beforehand, okay? You, you make the CPU, you make the microcontroller, and then you sell it. And then once the person gets it, you develop software for it. So the software, you don't go in and change the number, the types of instructions that can be executed by the, the CPU. The CPU already has a fixed number of instructions it's designed to execute. And those instructions were chosen by the designer of the CPU. So people at Intel decide which instructions they're going to, implement people at Texas Instruments. They decide we are gonna implement these instructions. And so that is done by the CPU designer. Uh, there's kind of two trains of thought with uh, instruction sets. One of them is a reduced instruction set approach. And what that means is that the, the manufacturers of these CPUs said, you know what? We can probably accomplish anything that we want to accomplish using just a few instructions. So maybe five, 10, maybe 20, maybe 22. <laughs> instructions. Uh, and even though these instructions are very simple, uh, will allow the developer to kind of be uh, clever with the way they use them. And, and if they'll be able to accomplish the task, the ultimate task that they want to do. It just might take executing more and more of these very, very simple instructions. And this reduced instruction set computer is called a risk architecture. And that's one approach. The, the other approach is to make a complex instruction set, uh, CISC, so a CISC one. And this is where you have a very large number of instructions. So you have instructions that are just tons and tons of instructions. And basically you have an instruction for anything you could ever come up with. When you think about instructions, what you're always thinking about is the hardware to implement the control unit uh, finite state machine. So remember, it's always gonna do a fetch and decode and then it's gonna take a path through one of these uh, one of these paths. It's gonna walk through one of these paths and execute that instruction. So every time you add a new instruction, you're basically adding a new path through the control unit state machine. So you can see immediately the implications of this in hardware. A reduced instruction set computer is gonna have fewer paths through here 
which will result in a smaller amount of hardware implemented on the integrated circuit. A complex instruction set will have more and more instructions and they will be more sophisticated. So you'll have more and more of these states in each of the execution paths and it's gonna result in a lot larger uh, hardware. So you can see there's trade-offs between these. In a RISC architecture, you know, a smaller CPU, you're gonna be able to execute the instructions a little bit quicker because the, there's not as much delay due to the small uh, size of the circuitry. Uh, but it does require a large number of operations to accomplish a, a given task. A CISC architecture has increased physical size of the computer, so it might actually uh, run a, a touch slower, but it is able to execute the instructions, uh, I guess, quickly, because even though it's slower, each instruction can actually do more functionality. And so you're going to need fewer instructions to accomplish a different uh given task. The MSP430 we're going to use is considered a risk instruction. It has, uh, I believe, 22 instructions. Okay, <clears throat> now, what, what types of uh, instructions exist? Well, no matter what kind of computer you have, there's basically three classes of instructions. The first one is called a data movement instruction. And a data movement instruction refers to moving information back and forth between CPU registers and the memory. Okay. And when I say the memory system, I'm, I'm talking about the ports also. So you can imagine that in program memory, you're going to have information that says, okay, this is a data movement instruction. And the information coming from program memory might indeed be the information that will be put into a register. It might be a constant that's part of the, op or the instruction. And that's fine. Uh, you might also have information that's in data memory that needs to be moved in there. It operates very similar because uh, when everything has an address out here in this memory map system, it's it's simply just an address that you go get information from. Same thing with ports. You might read from a port address and put that into a register or vice versa. You might take registers and move them back into any one of these three memory mapped components. That is called a data movement instruction. So remember, it's always moving information from memory back and forth to the CPU registers. That's very important that you say registers because remember, you don't put information in a state machine. The state machine looks at inputs and creates outputs, but it doesn't have storage. ALU doesn't have storage. It's just a, a combination of logic circuit that can do all these operations. The only place you can store information in the CPU is within a register. Uh, okay, back and forth, that's the first class of instructions. The other type of uh, instruction, second class, is a data manipulation instruction. And what this means is that you are going to take information and mess with it using the ALU. So this, this could be you want to add two numbers, you want to complement two numbers, you want to add two things together, you want to shift something. All the circuitry that exists within the ALU to perform all those various instructions that were pre, you know, built into the CPU, those instructions are called data manipulation instructions. And all, in general, they typically work on information that resides within CPU registers, okay? So you typically, you know, in general, if you want to move or you want to mess with information in data memory, you move it into a register, then you mess with it in the ALU and the output goes back to a register, and then you would put it out to another location in memory. So those, that's the second class. And then the third class is where you actually start building up kind of the intelligence of a program or the ability to respond to results or inputs. And this third class is called program flow instructions. And what this means is you imagine this program memory down here and you just have all these instruction opcodes that sit and they're in a big sequence and you're executing them one after the other, after another, after another, after another. At some point, you're gonna have to tell the the system, the computer, to move back up to the top and start executing again. Otherwise, you're just going to increment addresses and you're going to run out of range of your program memory addresses. So there are these program flow instructions talk about how you alter the program counter address. Okay, so imagine that the program counter address is marching along. So let's say you're starting at address 8000. It's 8000, 8001, 8002, 8003, 8004. If you needed to then have an instruction that changed the program counter so that you could repeat that, you would then have a unconditional program flow instruction that would alter the program counter and move it back up to the beginning of program memory. That's very important. That's like an uh, unconditional loop or a while always or a, a loop that will always repeat. And you know that that's necessary because computer programs, once you run them, they run forever, right? You don't want to 
in a microcontroller application, you don't want the thing to like run for a while and then stop. So that's an unconditional program flow instruction. The other type is a conditional program flow instruction, and that is where you actually might jump over uh, particular instructions. So for example, you're marching along, you're 8,000, 8,002, you're at instruction A, instruction A, instruction B, instruction B, instruction A, and then all of a sudden a result comes out. And the next instruction directly in memory is one that you want to skip. So you actually might jump over that instruction. And when I say jump over it, what I mean is that instead of all incrementing the program counter sequentially, you might move it down like 10 addresses. And in effect, you've jumped over a, a group of instructions and you didn't execute them. This is how we implement things like if else statements, case statements, uh, conditional looping structures. And it's an if else statement is basically you're just going to have instructions in there which implement the if part and also the else part. And you will jump over one or the other depending on the result of some operation. So that's the conditional program flow instruction. Now, again, we are going to code these later, right? So it's like you, you just want to know the terminology, but it might not sink in this minute, but it will sink in once we actually start putting the instructions down and actually watching them execute. Okay, op codes. <laughs> Every instruction has a unique binary code assigned to it, and that is called its op code. Once again, it is assigned by the designers of the CPU. So if you're going to move information between two registers, it's going to have some unique binary code that tells the CPU that this is exactly what this instruction does. Now, we don't tend to talk in binary. Well, I mean, some people do, but <laughs> mostly we talk in kind of like, you know, English, to be honest with you. I mean, I do. Uh, and so, or whatever language you talk in. And I'm not talking like C, I'm talking like, what's your language? Every instruction is assigned a unique word that describes its operation. So for example, uh, and it's called a mnemonic. Okay? It's kind of a funky spelling. It's M-N, but it's called mnemonic. Mnemonic. And so, and they're very simple. It's nothing fancy. But for example, if you had an add instruction, okay, that's going to perform addition, it will have a binary code. And it will also have a mnemonic that might also be called add. Ta-da! <laughs> so the mnemonics are very, they are very descriptive, I guess, but they're also very simple. And it's also key because you can actually develop programs at the instruction level, okay? So for example, if you said, I'm gonna put down an add instruction, followed by a move instruction, followed by a complement instruction, you can actually program the computer and write out its opcodes directly in binary and put them into memory, put them into program memory. But that sucks, that's really hard to do. Instead, you could go up one level of abstraction and program at the mnemonic level. So imagine you open up a file and you type in ADD for add, and then you give it some arguments that say you want to add this register to this register. That's a little bit higher level of abstraction because you actually, instead of using the opcode binary, you use the agreed upon mnemonic. And the agreed upon mnemonic is given to you also by the CPU manufacturer. And when you program at this level, it's called assembly programming. So assembly programming is where you open up a file and instead of writing in C, you write in the mnemonics pr provided by the CPU manufacturer. So in, in there's syntax you have to follow, but you're, you're always thinking about it where you're programming instruction by instruction. Every line you put in your program is an instruction and it also has a agreed upon mnemonic. Now, that, this is how we start learning computer architecture because we can start moving information around the computer instruction by instruction, and we get to see how things actually operate before we jump up into a higher level language like C, where we kind of abstract the hardware behavior. If you write an assembly, okay, you are going to use an assembler, which is kind of like the equivalent of a compiler, but we call it an assembler because really it's just a translator. It translate the, translates these mnemonics into the, uh, into the binary codes, the binary opcodes that are associated with that instruction. Okay, so we're gonna talk about assemblers. Now, there are instructions that, that require additional information in order to be executed. For example, when I say you have an add instruction, you need to know what you're adding. So you have to provide additional information along with that 
add instruction, and that addif additional information is called an operand. Okay? Now, opcodes and operands uh, are necessary. Some instructions might not need an operand. Some instructions require one operand. Some instructions require two operands. It just depends on the instruction. So let's take a look at like an example assembly language instruction. So I open a file and I'm going to program, I'm going to put an instruction in here and then I'm going to assemble it. There is an instruction uh, that's called move and it's called, and it's mnemonic is MOV. Okay, not MOVE, <laughs> that'd be too easy. It's MOV. And so that mnemonic is associated with an instruction that will move information back and forth between locations in the computer. I need an, an operand because I need to know where are you moving the information from and where are you moving it to. So this source field right here, comma space destination field right here, is how you would provide that information. And they might be something like R4 to R5. So I would move whatever, whatever's in R4 into R5, or I might move information from an address location in data memory to a port, whatever. But this is an example of programming almost at assembly language. I say almost because we haven't actually put values directly into the, into the, the operand field. Here's another example, add. There's an instruction that, is, that performs addition and its mnemonic is ADD. Okay, that makes, that makes pretty good sense. And when you do an add, you still have to provide an operand because you need to know what are you adding together? In this example, we'll go into these in detail in the future here, but for this one, basically what it does is it takes this source address and the destination, adds these two together, and it puts the result or the sum in the destination, okay? So that's an example of an instruction, okay? Not a big deal, but each instruction, whenever you lay it down, you gotta think, does it have an operand? What kind of operand does it have? Does it have one operand, does it have two? Here's an example of, a, of an instruction that increments something, and it only needs one operand. So when you increment something, you're just going to add one to the value. So you don't need a destination and a source. This one just has a destination. You like increment R4 and you'll add one to R4 and then you're done. So that's kind of an example of how this, of how assembly language might look. Now let's talk about program development flow. When you use the word compiler, most everybody has heard the term compiler. <clears throat> that is used to convert a high level programming language into a binary. So that is used for languages like C, okay? So if I write something in C, I need to compile it. Notice that it's very high level. You don't actually worry about the hardware. You allow the compiler to actually take care of that. If you program at a lower level, like assembly, you are closer to the hardware in terms of you're laying instructions down in a file to do something very low level. You still are using a mnemonic, but you're using an assembler to get there, okay? So that's the difference between C and assembly. We will do both in this book. We will write, first we will write assembly and then use an assembler to create the actual binaries that go into program memory. And that'll show us how to use the hardware and it'll show us how our computer actually works. Then we'll jump up into C and we'll actually use a compiler that will then generate the same binaries for us and we'll be able to program at a little bit higher level of abstraction. So let's take a look uh, at some of the other tools in the flow. A linker, you probably have heard about this, but a linker is what joins multiple source files into, uh, it joins them together and helps create kind of a final program code. The linker doesn't just add uh, multiple source files together. Like for example, if you had two assembly files you wanted to merge together, it brings in other information about the actual mic microcontroller that you're using. And so it actually brings in information about the memory map and, and addresses and how everything is constructed. Because sometimes when you're programming, you, don't, you might not need to concern yourself with where program memory is. For example, a linker can bring in some of the files that'll, that actually do have that information. Once you bring all this thing together and you create a linker uh, and you link it, you can finally get to an executable object file. And this is the binaries that actually are downloaded into program memory. Microcontrollers almost always have their, their program memory implemented with double EEPROM, and there's going to be a circuit that actually dumps the binaries into the program memory double EEPROM. A debugger is kind of the final piece to this. Once the program is on the MCU, you can actually use a tool to go in a back door of, of the processor and actually 
see what's going on. So you can actually see the values of registers. You can step the program, meaning that you move it one instruction at a time and watch what's happening in memory, watch what's happening in the registers. And this allows you to debug your program at a very low level. Sometimes you download your program and nothing happens. And you can't really, you keep resetting it and it just doesn't work. So one, one of the only ways you can figure out what's going on is actually go look at the binary, the ones and zeros and all the registers as these instructions are stepped through. Okay, so let's look at a, let's, the last thing here is to kind of look at a, a flow chart of how this might work. If you create a C program, okay, like main.c, you are going to run a compiler. And a, a compiler will, will need to go out. It, it needs to know what you're compiling for, what microprocessor. And so it's going to bring in information about the instruction set and the memory map. And it's going to bring that all together when you hit compile. But in the flow that we use for this microcontroller, the MSP430, the output of this is actually an assembly file. So it actually maps these in, down into instructions and it gives you the ability to see the assembly file. It creates a main.asm. asm.asm is the assembly extension for the MSP430 tools. And now we have that. And you can actually go look at what the C was compiled into in terms of the instructions and the mnemonics. And, and it's really neat. Then you run assembler, and that takes the assembly file and creates object files. And there's multiple object files that are created. And then those are taken by the linker. And the linker brings in other very fine, just gory details of the actual uh, hardware, and this brings it all together and creates this final executable object file. And this is the ones and zeros that go down into the double EEPROM program memory of the MCU. Now you're sitting down here at the microcontroller and you're running it and it doesn't work. So then you bring a computer over and you plug in a cable and you're able to go into the back door of this microcontroller and actually see the ones and zeros as the instructions execute. So that's a general overview of the program flow. And like I say, it's mainly terminology at this point. You'll see these steps as we start actually developing programs and downloading them. But that is what we call the computer software. So as always, remember, life is good. And subscribe to my channel so you're always getting the most recent videos.